technology. Hi, Peter. Good morning. <laughs> this time I'm going to let you talk instead of just pointing out your your face full of coffee. Um, I'm so glad to have you on the show. Finally, you've been incredibly busy, and we're going to get to see some of or hear some about um, what you've been busy on today. But I'm I'm really happy in part because you are a delightful human being who I really enjoy working with, um, but also because your work is genuinely so fascinating. And um, am I right in saying that one of the projects you're going to tell us about today, um, it's really the first time you kind of talked about it publicly? Yes. Yep. We'll be talking about completely new stuff today. Oh, that's so exciting. OK. Yeah. Um, so yes, everyone, get your questions ready. A reminder that you can leave them in the Facebook comment section anytime or in the YouTube chat. And um, we have lots of scientists at the Academy and in the world who are always really um, excited about their work and made happy by their work. But I kind of feel like you always have a sort of extra extra excitement or extra twinkle relative to yours. And how did you find your way to geology in the first place? Wow, um, studying snails actually. Oh. <laughs> so I, I, was, um, I have a background as a marine biologist also. And in my early days in graduate school, I was working on marine snails and became very interested in their sort of long-term evolution. They have an awesome fossil record. And so I wanted to study their evolution from the perspective of history in the fossil record. And to do that, I got into paleontology. And to do paleontology, you really have to know your geology. So I went on and got my PhD in geology. <laughs> so you really saw yourself as a marine biologist for a while? For a while. Um, yeah, biologist, uh, marine biologist. And, and I still do a lot of yeah. modern marine biology also. But yes, I guess technically I'm a geologist and paleontologist. Yeah, that's um, incredible. I also really like the story. I remember when I surprised you in your office live on camera and required, what did I ask you? I asked you what your favorite fossil you've ever encountered yeah. was. And what did, what was it again? I don't remember the answer. <laughs> what, oh, OK. What let me set it up for you. <laughs> no, it was, I think it was two dinosaurs like embroiled in a fight to the death. Is that right? Yeah, so right. I remember at the time we we were just learning about this, uh, this specimen or this these incredible specimens that have been unearthed um, up in uh, the upper western U.S. of two dinosaurs sort of locked in this death embrace. And not only is a spectacular fossil, both dinosaurs are well preserved, but it's it, it captures captures action, right? It's not yeah. just like the dead organism, but it captured part of their lives. So yeah, at the time my my yeah, brain was racing. I I I I spend a lot of time studying how things eat other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like the thing that I have taken away from your work when I've heard about it or spoken to you about it. Um, is just I've been so amazed that the, about by the stories that fossils tell, how big those stories are, and how much further they go beyond kind of what I imagine they could tell us. Um, so I will get out of the way and I will give you your um, presentation. And yes, folks, get your questions in early. We'll be collecting them all stream and asking them at the end. And Peter, I'll hand it over to you and see you in a bit. Great, thanks, Laurel. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. And um, really, I hope that everybody is doing well. You know, these are uh, difficult times for all of us, and I'm glad that we can do, you know, offer this series from the Academy, help to make the days uh, pass a little bit more pleasantly. Today, I'm going to talk to you, I'm, as Laurel said, I'm a paleontologist, but my talk today is actually sort of a way that a number of my interests have come together. I spend a lot of time thinking about what the fossil record can teach us about the future. So how have we dealt with opportunities and crises in the past? And not we as humans, but we as a living planet, and what that might mean for the future when we as humans are changing the planet so rapidly. And I've always had a deep interest in, in history and including uh, human history. And one of the things that I've been interested in over the last few years is what causes human societies or what have caused human societies in the past to either complex societies to lose their complexity or to collapse and disappear altogether. And as we learn more and more about this from sort of amazing modern work by historians and archeologists and sociologists, climatologists, geochemists, and so on, is that there are several themes that recur over and over again. And I used to have this 
sort of trite way of saying, hey, if you if you wanted to collapse a civilization in the past, you could do one or two of two things. One, you could hit it with a mega drought or you could hit it with an epidemic. And so these days, you know, I've had climate change on my mind for a long time, but these days uh, epidemics and, and pandemics, of course, are on the minds of many, um, most, most of us, I think. And so today I'm gonna to talk about work that actually pulls together a lot of my interests in ecosystems, particularly ecosystems of the past, so fossil ecosystems, epidemics, and economies, which are one very important aspect of our human societies. So let's get into this. <clears throat> so I've been stuck at home, um, uh, thankfully employed, stuck at home since you know, the middle of March when the academy closed to the public, closed to staff. Bay Area counties in California went into a shutdown, shelter in place orders. And then uh, very quickly after that on March 16th, California went into a statewide shelter in place um, order system and a shutdown of many services, businesses, and so on. And one of the things that I've been doing, I'm sure we're all trying to find outlets. I've been working a lot, but I cannot sit inside my room all the time, my study or whatever. Um, and work because I spent a lot of my time, for example, when I would travel to the academy commuting and I would be outside a lot. So I've been spending a lot of time in my garden and I have a bit of an odd garden. So on the screen here, you can see my garden consists of sort of the somewhat typical urban ecosystem. I have cultivated things like I have an orange tree that I love and has really loved me back this year because I've been around to tend to it properly. I've planted a lot of native and drought resistant plants. So in the middle photo there, you can see the ceanothus. I have a whole hedge of ceanothus. And along with these, these plants is what I call my little urban ecosystem. We have a lot of animal visitors, both uh, domestic as well as native bees and bumblebees, lots of butterflies and, and moths. This is a moth caterpillar in the middle and the occasional vertebrate uh, popping by this really very impressive king snake. Um, you know, you do a double take when you see these things around here, make sure it's not a rattler. It's not a rattler. Uh, the thing was probably close to five feet long. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> in addition to the cultivated, cultivated things, um, because of where I, I live up on a high ridge, I think I get a lot of visitors to the yard and a lot of orphan plants and they're always springing up. And I'm not a botanist or a horticulturist. I, I love plants, I love my garden. I don't know them as well as I should. And I will usually, when I see something, you know, a little seedling that comes up that's odd, I'll tend to it for a while before I figure out what, what it is. And the garden is littered with these orphans, many of whom are thriving. Now, if you look at the photo on the left here where it says April, you see that I have this little patch of flowers dominated by those orange ones, those are California poppies, and this sort of lush lawn around it. The lush lawn is a feature of natural rainfall in spring. And when we begin to get our rains, hopefully usually around November in this region, they only last, the rains last for a very, and, and the snow very, very occasionally, but in the mountains we get a lot of snow, but the wet period, around here lasts for only a few months, about four months of the year, and then we're very dry. So for about four and a half to five months of the year, I have this uh, beautiful looking grassy meadow in the front, and then it dries out, and you can see what it looked like yesterday when I took this photo, and I'll, I, let it, I let it dry, I don't, I don't irrigate or water. But look at that patch, right? That's what I wanted to point out. This thing started as one very tiny plant that had a little flower on it, a California aster, and California asters are very pretty wildflower around here, and you see them all the time. So I was excited a couple of years ago when this one showed up and I let it grow. This thing has expanded into a big, large, thriving patch now. But what's really interesting about this, to me anyway, is that it's really diversified. There have been other plants coming into it over time, and some of them last for just a short time. They'll come in in spring, they spring up, and they don't really make it. 
but there's a group that's sort of slowly and steadily increasing in diversity of new orphans coming into this patch and together they really thrive and they make this productive little environment. Diversity is growing. It's a very wet patch almost all year round. That's one of its secrets. And this is one of the things that um, leads to this question that's central to a lot of ecology. How do multiple species come together? How do they coexist and coexist stably and form stable or long lasting communities? And it's an important question for many reasons. So how do these species find each other and come together? How do they coexist? Because one of the like dirty little secrets of nature, I like to say is that many, many species don't like other species. And if you could exist in the world by yourself, many species would be just fine. Nobody else to compete with for resources, nobody eating you, and supposedly you, will, you would have a happy and stable supply of food. So this is really a central question to ecology. And in thinking about this, thinking about the how this came to be, because I'll, I'll back up for a moment. When communities come together, like my patch, for example, there are a couple of things that might have happened that caused it to thrive. One, these species simply found each other randomly in my garden and they have certain properties, properties that together allow them to thrive. However, more likely than that, given that we're looking at native species, the California poppy, uh, the asters, and so on, is that these species also have long histories together. They have evolutionary histories together. And there's both uh, those histories have sorted the species so that the species that you find are ones that can live together. They can coexist in the, under the same sorts of environmental conditions, but also you have many of these species have been co-evolving together also. So they're not independent of each other and it's not actually really an accident that I have the patch that I have today. So I've been studying the history of how ecosystems might arise, how the species in them coexist, and how they may remain stable for long periods of geologic time and evolutionary time. And on the left here, you'll see an example of one of these ecosystems. It's a, I'll explain the diagram in a little bit, but it shows that you know, these are complex systems with lots of species in them, lots of interactions. But it's, an ecosystem is not the only kind of complex system that we deal with in the world today. The world abounds in complex systems. The internet is a complex system. Many of these systems are human made. The internet, the World Wide Web. On the right, you'll see a map of industries in the global economy. Lots of different pieces all interacting. And of course, at the top there, I've shown the pandemic. And, and pandemics are one function of many types of complex human systems. How we move around spaces. These days, how we move around the planet, for example. And what we have today is, in my mind, this collision of different types of complex systems, sort of a perfect storm all coming together. And it's a somewhat unique moment in human history. And one of the things that I'm interested in and many other uh, scientists are interested in also is understanding what it means, what are we dealing with now when these systems all collide? And that's what I'll be talking about today. To sort of uh, get into it, <clears throat> we, I'll follow a web of ideas. And this slide is just acknowledging two things. One, that what I'm going to talk about for the next you know, 30, 40 minutes or so depends on the work of a lot of people in the past and in the present. And there are people, there are scientists and scholars and thinkers in multiple disciplines. <clears throat> and you can work independently. You can work in a silo, but nothing is truly independent of each other in, in nature, including the human world. And also, even if you're somewhat independent, we could think of you independently, um, that option for us as humans is disappearing rapidly. We're making the world smaller. and We're pulling all of these ideas together. So in the upper left um, are uh, two, two scientists that were really central to how we think about complex systems as networks. There's Eugene Wigner, 
Rick Bigner, who was a scientist, um, one of the scientists that worked on the Manhattan Project, developing the first atomic uh, bombs, and Robert May, Lord Robert May, former president of the Royal Society of England, um, scientific advisor to the UK prime minister and so on, who sadly passed away um, several months ago. Then we have thoughts of deep history that is all about evolution. And so I've popped in an, an image there of Charles Darwin, as well as understanding history, not necessarily from the evolutionary side, I think theoretical, but sheer record keeping, understanding that the earth in the past was both very, very different from the world that we have today, but in many ways was also very familiar. And we ask questions, how does this change and so on? And a lot of this work was driven by the field paleontologist, Mary Anning, who opened up our eyes to what going out into nature and discovering what's in the fossil record can tell us about the world around us. In the upper right, I have an epidemiologist, Ronald Ross. We'll talk about him later too. Um, his work and the work of a couple of his uh, protégés is really central to everything that we're doing today to try to deal with the pandemic. And I popped in a photo there of my dean and chief scientist at the academy, Dr. Shannon Bennett, who's a resident virologist. And my ear has been tuned in to her for the last few months, learning an awful lot about epidemics. And in the bottom right, um, there's Vasily Leontiev, who's a Russian, was a Russian economist, and came up with this wonderful idea that's central to how we measure economies and economic activity today. We're going to talk quite a bit about that later on. And John Keynes, who is one of the most important economists of the 20, 20th century, and in many ways was the architect of the global economy that we have today that was designed in large part uh, toward the close of, of World War II. Okay, so <clears throat> let's begin with Wigner and, and May and something we call today the Wigner-May theorem where Wigner just asked a really simple question. He was trying to figure out how to make calculations of how things like plutonium atoms, uranium atoms can begin cascades of runaway chain reactions that yield tremendous amounts of energy, whether that's an atomic uh, weapon or um, a nuclear fission reaction for energy production, for example. And Wigner came up with this idea that you can use random networks to really treat large systems of numbers and gain some really critical insights into this. This was in the 1950s and about 20 years later, Robert May then comes along who's a physicist and ecologist, one of the great theoretical ecologists of our, of our time. And he sort of in many ways rediscovered Wigner's work. And together they made some observations that are central to how we think about complex systems. The more pieces, the more entities that you have interacting in the system on average, the less stable it will be. And by stable, we mean can everybody who's in that system right now, our little network here, for example, make it from one interval of time to the next, or will some of them, because of their properties, because of the way things interact, be lost to us? The more connections that you have between these nodes, so the denser the network, the less stable it is, the stronger the interactions, whatever those interactions might be. So the impact of one node or little circle on the other, one species on the other, one business on another, the stronger the interactions, the less stable the system will be. And May, thinking about ecology and ecosystems, then uh, made the very, very bold pronouncement that complex ecosystems with lots of species interacting with each, with each other should not be stable and sparked what in, call, in ecology we call the complexity stability debate, because intuitively we would think that the richer an ecosystem, the more species you have in it, the more business that's taking place in the ecosystem, the more stable it should be. So which is it? And of course we have the observation that even though May demonstrated with very rigorous mathematics that complexity should not equal stability, when we go out in nature, we do see very complex ecosystems. So in the diagrams that I'm showing here on the left, 
This is a coral reef food web from Jamaica. You can see these little circles around here on the edge. Those are individual species. All of the lines in between, those are what we call trophic interactions or predator-prey in, predator interactions. This is a rich system, although relatively not rich compared to coral reefs elsewhere in the world. And it's a very busy system. On the right, we have a similar food web from down here in the bottom left. We have, um, which we can get rid of, I keep seeing the slide thing on my screen here. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom left, we have uh, a coral reef from the northeast of Trinidad. And Jamaica and Trinidad are the two places where I grew up. I'm from both of those islands. And as you can see, even the significantly less rich coral reef system in that part of Trinidad, it's one of the few fringing reefs in that part of the world, is still a pretty complex and pretty busy system. Think of this as a number of humans interacting. So how do we reconcile this kind of notion that these systems should not be stable, yet here they are? Well, the first thing to note is that ecosystems are not random. You'll note here in the Jamaican system that I'm showing that it's divided, sort of those, the nodes or the species, into four main uh, colors. And those colors represent sub-communities in the system. And those sub-communities tell us that that system is not just this big jumble of a network, but it's a network that's subdivided into the very distinct sets of food chains, for example. And those food chains have distinct sources of energy, whether those might be macroalgae or seaweeds, or there might be phytoplankton floating in the water, or they might be dependent on the symbionts that corals harbor, many corals harbor within their tissues. And this compartmentalization of the community into sub-communities adds a tremendous amount of stability. And this is one of the ways that you can disrupt this notion of an ecosystem being a random system. They're not random. And so one of the things that I've been very interested in is where does this non-randomness come from? So in order to answer that, we've been going into the past and looking at very, very old to extremely old ecosystems. So shown here on the left, for example, is a food web diagram again, similar to the ones that I showed for the modern coral reefs. But this time, we're looking at a food web that existed in the Tethys Ocean in the region that's now Western and Central Europe. It was a, it was a notion for much of the Mesozoic era from about 250 to uh, sometime well into maybe 50 million years ago as it slowly closed up. So this is a food web from the Tethys Ocean about 245 million years ago. And there's a beautiful um, illustration of what some of the organisms in that system, the vertebrates might have looked like from some of my colleagues at the University of Zurich and you can see this is a very rich system also. It shares many features of the modern coral reef. It is compartmentalized, it has distinct subcommunities, distinct food chains, and for all intents and purposes, it was a highly stable system. It lasted for millions of years. Now, I'm going to digress for just a moment here because I just want to tell you a little bit about how, how do we get that diagram, right? To get the, the diagram, or the network of a modern coral reef food web, I depend on work that myself, but literally hundreds of other scientists have done since the 1950s. Um, I went back into historical records going all the way back to the 19th century, but we can go out, we can observe, we can document, we can describe the modern system. That's basically what we do for the fossil systems also, but it's, uh, it's based on working in areas where we have oceans that have long since disappeared. So on the left, um, these two images here are taken from field work that we did somewhere in the mountains of Hubei in China, looking at systems that were anywhere from 252 to about 248 million years old. Um, in the top center here, we're working on a slightly younger system this time we're in uh, Southeast Nevada, and it's also based on, the, on this type of work by 
all of the community of scientists around us all documenting this material. And one of the roles of the California Academy of Sciences is we archive, physically archive this material. So this view here is one long shot into some of the geology collections that we house at the Academy with millions of these specimens. And on the, on the right is one of those spectacular specimens. It's about 80 million years old. It's an ammonite, a shelled relative of squid and octopus that lived in Northern California. So it's based on a lot of field work, a lot of documentation, and a lot of time sitting at computers with, with databases. Oh, I just want to point out here too, you know, one of the contrasts here, you might not be able to see the fossil. The fossil, and we'll come back to this in a moment, is right here. It's a little ammonite in cross section. And then down here, I'll explain those later on because most people wouldn't appreciate what an exciting fossil it is. Okay, so let's move forward. This figure is one of the most famous diagrams or figures in paleontology. It is uh, Jack Sepkowski's, which is due to a uh, University of Chicago paleontologist by the name of Jack Sepkowski, who compiled what marine biodiversity looked like for the last 540 million years. And if we look at just the upper curve here, we can see that this biodiversity has gone through a number of changes over time. Of particular interest to me, for example, is the fact that for much of this time here, biodiversity rose very rapidly and then it plateaued. And there are dips, you can see these dashed lines marking the mass extinctions. The one that I'm particularly interested in, we're going to talk about, is that Permal Triassic one at about 250 million years ago, which was the most severe mass extinction we have documented in the fossil record. And we spend a lot of time thinking about mass extinctions and how we lose biodiversity. But of equal interest is the fact that for very long stretches of geologic time, ranging from hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, we will have ecosystems that remain relatively unchanged. And this is a bit of a puzzle, right? Because these ecosystems are sitting in a world that's constantly changing. They're sitting in a geosphere that's always changing. Climate is changing, climate is varying. We have plate tectonics moving the continents around. We have polar ice caps that grow and, and disappear. So it's a world of constant change. Internally within the ecosystem, organisms are always evolving. So species are changing as they move through history. Species come and go, so the composition of the ecosystem changes, yet the basic structure of that ecosystem can remain relatively unchanged for a long period of, period of time. Think back to what Wigner and May said. It's a bit of a puzzle. In order to address this puzzle, we've been studying this so-called mother of all mass extinctions, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction that occurred 251 million years ago. And in a nutshell, to understand it, this extinction, about 251 and a half million years ago, what happened is that I like to say Siberia opened up. We enter into an episode of one of the most massive terrestrial volcanic events that we have documented in the last half billion years. There's sort of uh, several episodes for this. Earliest episode was a lot of eruptive volcanism that was probably climatically disruptive, but even more damaging was later on, several tens of thousands of years later on, there's a massive upwelling of magma again from inside the earth, but this time it doesn't go through the surface, there's no erupting volcanism, it gets up to the surface and begins to spread out, and in spreading out, it burns through massive carbon, coal deposits that have been laid down over a period of about the preceding 100 million years. And it's, it's a large greenhouse event, very similar to what we're doing today by burning fossil fuels. And so you have this episode of dramatic climate change, atmospheric changes, heating of the atmosphere, changing in gaseous composition, warming of the oceans, ocean acidification, many of the things that we are worried about and familiar with today. And it drives a large mass extinction. At least 80% of species in the ocean became extinct within a geologically and evolutionarily 
very short period of time, probably a few thousand years. And on land, about 70% of our terrestrial animals also become extinct. In order to study that, we go back to the fossil record where we documented, we want to know what was there, what did the ecosystem look like before? What did it look like during this massive uh, global changing event? And what did it look like after? What came back? How quickly did it come back? Did it last as long as the systems did prior to the mass extinction? And so I'm revisiting these two images at the bottom. On the left, we're looking at the cross section of an ammonite, like that beautiful one from California that I showed you. On the right, here we are getting really excited. This is a sample from after the extinction. One is before, the one on the right is after. And we're not looking at an ammonite, we're not looking at a beautiful clam or a vertebrate bone. We're looking at very tiny traces, feeding traces of organisms that tell us we have a rich fossil record, we have an interval where there's essentially nothing in the rock record. And then we get these little traces that tells us that of course life persisted and things are beginning to happen again. The ecosystem is beginning to trickle back. And uh, to then just show on the left here, we're looking at South Africa and down at the bottom here is a Karoo Basin that preserves one of, it's one of the best preserved terrestrial ecosystems we have from that time. It's one of the most well-known terrestrial fossil records we have from that time. And so we've been going back to this time in South Africa and now other regions of Southern Africa and reconstructing what that heavily forested ecosystem looked like. And here's some examples, illustrations and fossils of what some of the animals would have been at that time. And these are not dinosaurs. They're not even reptiles. They're ancient, uh, ancient relatives of mammals. So they're your distant cousins. Okay. So I'll try to sum this up very, very quickly. On the left, we have a picture of what the ecosystem looked like before the mass extinction. This is a late Permian, lower adaptocephalus assemblage zone. There's a technical name for it. And each of the circles there in the food web represents groups of species that perform, perform certain functions. And so this is a functional view of the ecosystem. What were the job occupations what were the services being performed by the organisms and how did they interact with each other? On the right is the early Triassic, the Strasaurus zone. And this is the earliest ecosystem to arise in the wake of the mass extinction. Very importantly, two things to note. The ecosystem that arises very quickly after the mass extinction is almost as rich in terms of species as the ecosystem that we lost during the, the mass extinction. And functionally, it is as diverse as a system prior to the mass extinction, but it's different. Notice that we have different groups of circles, right? We have different functions, we have different organisms, but it's just as rich, just as busy. But were they the same? Were they of equal stability? And one of the ways we do this is we, we use a lot, we do a lot of math, and we'll talk about a lot, uh, some math later on. But here's a picture of one of the things we do. We can model these ecosystems and how they function. And this figure is showing one of the experiments we run with these models of the ecosystems. In this case, we're just slowly turning off the energy in the system because the decline of energy, the decline of the ability of plants to produce energy was the most central killing mechanism in the extinction. So if you look at the blue curve, as we go along this bottom axis that says magnitude of perturbation, we're turning off more and more of the energy. The level of that curve on the, the where it says secondary extinction is telling us how many species have gone extinct as a result of turning off the energy. And you can see there's this very sort of level response of the system. And then at some point, somewhere around 60%, it begins to climb very rapidly, and then it accelerates and the system collapse, collapses where you've essentially lost everything. That is very characteristic of ecosystems in general. Now the pink curve 
that's printed in the background. This is the Lystrosaurus system, the one that we had right after. It shows a similar pattern, but there's a really big difference. See how that red band is much broader? That tells us that when we run the experiments, um, we have two differences between the pre-extinction and the post-extinction system. The first difference is that it's just much more variable. It's, it's much more sensitive. So if we turn off 40% of the energy, we get this response on the blue curve, okay? And it's kind of low level, remains flat. When we do the same thing to the post-extinction system, very, very minor differences in what that system might have looked like makes a big difference. It's sensitive to the specific conditions that it would have been existing in at that time. And so this is a very shaky, dicey kind of system. If you hit it with a drought, one year it might be fairly robust. The second year it might be collapsed. It might collapse. It's a boom and bust kind of system. And then the other thing to note is that there's, there's a difference in the rate at which these things climb also, and that overall you could get higher levels of species loss. So even though we have a system coming back after the mass extinction that's just as rich and has just as much functionality in it, it's probably not a system that could last for several million years in the same way that the pre-extinction system did. It's going to have a different history, or in this case would have had a different future. So one other way of looking at this, okay, you don't need to know anything about how we derived these little boxes. But what I'm going to tell you is when you look at these boxes, just think the bluer the color, the better off the system is. The warmer the color as you get into the greens and the reds, um, the less good it is. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the ecosystem to a couple of theoretical alternatives on the left. We compare the system to the kind of random types of ecosystems that Robert May thought about. And you can see we're, we're looking at the pre-extinction system now. And we've, we're looking that Cube is looking at many, many different ways in which that system could have existed and, and operated and comparing it under all of those conditions, millions of different variations to random networks. And what that the blue Cube is telling us is that essentially under all conditions, the ecosystem that we had would be better than something of equal richness, of equal complexity, but randomly organized, the real ecosystem would have been better. And that's a, a basic truth. All true ecosystems, basically all real ecosystems are better than random. In the middle one now, what we did there is we said, what if as a system went through time, history played out a little bit differently than what we observed. And so we play with the history and we come up with different ideas of what the, the ecosystem could have looked like. And under almost all circumstances, the real system, so you can see this big box of yellowish green there is telling us that for a large part of this ecological space, the real ecosystem was better still than any of the millions of alternatives we could dream upon the computer. Now let's fast forward here to uh, the post-extinction system. And what you need to look at there is the second cube with that big chunk of red. And what it tells us is that alternative histories, if, if history had played out differently than it actually did, more often than not, you would have wound up with something more stable. And so the recovery, unlike those processes that would give rise to that productive stable patch in my garden, the long evolutionary processes that gave rise to the pre-extinction system, what happened after the extinction um, was nothing stable. And in fact, to get back to an ecosystem that was as stable as prior to the extinction took at least about 7 million years. Okay, so this just sums up essentially what I said. Real ecosystems always better, functional diversity important functional structure, so not just the functional diversity, but how is that diversity put together? How is it connected? I think is even more important than just having a lot of functional diversity. And how you put that together is very much a function, if you will, of evolution, selection, and history.
So what does this all mean for us today? Well, here is a headline on the left that I woke up to in early January. Usually when I wake up, the first thing I'll do is I'll pop my phone and I'll look at a few news outlets, including BBC News. And this is what I saw. China pneumonia outbreak, mystery virus probed in Wuhan. It caught my attention for a couple of reasons. One is academic. Um, in studying the ecosystems during times of mass extinction, prior to and recovery, one of the things we understand is if you want to really understand how a complex system works, whether it's an ecosystem, a human society, an economic system, an immune system, one of the most revealing set of circumstances is to examine that system when it's under extreme stress. That's when the really interesting properties come out. But of course, extreme stress um, is not something that happens every day. And there are definitely dangers and ethical issues associated with stressing important systems today. It's one of the reasons we can go into the past and do this. So I'm always on the lookout for things that might stress environmental disasters, for example, that might stress modern systems to give us some insight and something to compare to our ancient ecosystems. And pandemics is something that I, I think about every now and then, even though we haven't had a serious one for a while. So I paid attention to this. And the other reason is that I have personal and professional ties in Wuhan. There I'm on, on the right just two years ago at the famous Yellow Crane Tower that is featured in the BBC um, photo. And um, to the left of me on the right of the photo is Dr. Yang Dong Huang, who is currently a member uh, researcher in my lab working on the ancient ecosystems. So I was interested and intrigued very early on. What was also interesting, of course, was how quickly this outbreak, and we now call the disease COVID-19, started to spread. And this is a figure from very early. This would uh, be in very late February, early March. And so these sort of hot spots that show up as big circles, this picture has changed completely already. So it took about um, six weeks for this to happen. Some of the hot spots, of course, hotspots in China, hotspots in Australia. And if you look at Europe, we're worried about France and Germany, for example. We're worried about the Northwest Pacific and the US. And of course, those have been completely replaced today. Italy is not really on the map there yet. And of course, Italy, New York are places that went on to have very severe outbreaks. And today we're struggling with outbreaks across the United States, across South America, in places such as South Africa and, and so on. So it spread very quickly. And it spread because of primarily because of human transportation networks. So let's uh, jump in very quickly because I don't want to take too much of your time this morning. What have we, what have we been doing with this? Well, we all know that we've been struggling to cope with this disease. And I, I like this, uh, this little, um, way of thinking about it that I think is due to Adam Kucharski has a great book out, a um, new book out, good timing, I guess, called Rules of Contagion, where he's thinking about, you've heard a lot about, you've probably about are not and are effective, sort of different ways of thinking about the rates of transmission of a disease, in this case, COVID-19, in a population. And how do you control R? How do you put the clamps on R? And he uses this dots approach to it, where we have to think um, R is a function of the duration. How long does the illness last in an individual? The opportunities for transmission, so an infected individual encountering an uninfected and susceptible individual. The transmission probability, so when those two individuals come together, the probability then that the infected individual actually will transmit the disease, so encounter and transmission, and then susceptibility, what is my susceptibility to get the disease? And we have different ways of managing this for communicable diseases, right? We can have effective treatments where you can lessen or shorten the duration, for example. We have effective preventions, many diseases, vaccines being our main tool where we Pre, uh, prepare ourselves, if you will, for the outbreak, and then we can manage rates of transmission. 
the tools that we have for dealing with COVID-19 are pretty limited right now. We do not have effective treatments. There are a few things online right now that appear to be very promising in maybe shortening the duration of the disease. And that's very important for survival of individuals. It's very important for maintaining things like hospital capacity. Um, but we don't have, we don't have a broad base of those yet. We have no way of preventing the disease in terms of the susceptibility of individuals. A lot of work, of course, is being done, a lot of progress being made in terms of developing uh, potential vaccines. What we can do, what we, what we could do right away is to attack the sort of the early stages, earliest steps of the transmission rate. That is the opportunities for transmission, bringing infected and susceptible persons together, and the transmission probability, of course, then that this um, is going to happen so that you're going to communicate the disease. So keep people apart. If they do come together, do things like wear a mask, wash your hands, um, be careful about contact surfaces and so on. So these are two of the things, of course, that have been used extensively globally to attack the disease. How we think about this um, goes all the way back to Ronald Ross. There he is up there in the upper right, who developed a lot of this work thinking about malaria. Um, he was a British scientist who worked in tropical regions and in Britain for a long time and developed the earliest models to uh, document how infection spreads. And then from there, protégés of his, Kendrick and Kermack, for example, names you might have heard today, then developed the, uh, the very basic model that we use. And there are many extensions, but the most basic one that we use to understand how diseases spread through population. And we call that the SIR model, the susceptible, infected, and removed, and removed. So susceptible means what's your population? Perhaps 100% of your population is susceptible to a particular disease at any given time. Infected, who is carrying the disease? How are they going to spread it? And removed, you are removed from the population of susceptibles and infected if you either recover from the disease or you do not and you, you are removed because of mortality. Um, the person dies. And shown here on the left are these famous SIR curves. The blue curve are susceptibles and you can see the population. Number of people who are susceptible declines over time. The number of infected is growing and that's why susceptibles are declining. More people are becoming infected, that's a red curve. And of course, and the number of people who are being removed um, is a green curve and that also grows over time. And this, of, this is an actual simulation based on COVID data. And this simulation I based using an initial transmission rate of 4.5, saying that on average, an infected person is going to infect about four and a half other people in the population. Now, one of the biggest concerns that we have with COVID-19 is you can see that red peak is falling somewhere above 40%, which means at its peak in this population, which by the way is based on the population of Los Angeles metropolitan area, we could have in a severe outbreak, we could have over more than 40% of the population being infected, which means that the ability of our health services to deal with the outbreak is greatly compromised. Now, let's just compare that to a situation where on average, an infected person is communicating the disease to 2.25 persons, two and a quarter persons instead of four and a half. You can see the difference in the red curve. That's the flattening the curve that everybody talks about. And two things to note here that are really important. First, notice that peak is much lower. We're buying ourselves hospital capacity. The other thing, look at the time scale in days. That peak now is occurring well off into the future compared to where it would occur when you have an R of 4.5. And that's buying you time, buying you time to cope, and importantly, buying, you, buying ourselves time to do things like further develop treatments and vaccines. Okay, so here's what I want to get into, though. So in order to, if we go back to thinking about dots, in order to 
to attack the curve, the infection curve. And to make this work, we restrict the opportunities and the probabilities for transmission. And we put in place shelter, we put shelter in place orders, we shut down many aspects of our society. And, you know, here are a couple of um, images sort of dramatically of that in California. One of the consequences of doing that, that we're very familiar with now, is the economic disruption that comes from that. On the left, this is a somewhat, this is from May, I believe, showing unemployment numbers in the United States. And we see things like World War II demobilization and the Great Recession of 2008. 2008. They barely show up on the scale compared to that red line at 2020, which is what we're dealing with now. When we put in, when we use shelter in place orders, when we shut down many uh, economic activities that we consider to be non-essential, what we've done is we've, we have created an economic shock. And that economic shock is both because of the inability of workers to work. We want people to be home. Um, but also it's secondary effects from that. One of the secondary effects is a lot of workers were laid off very quickly after the announcement of shelter in place orders before any shock to the economic system because of anticipation of an economic shock. Okay, that had consequences so I'll mention in a moment. On the right, is, a, is this is to, these are today's numbers. They came out this morning from the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. And this is where we stand right now with the GDP, the gross domestic product of the United States. Okay, you can see we're in very dire negative numbers. Why does this happen? Happened because the economy is a network. Information travels, economic shocks have impacts elsewhere in the economy. And here's just one aspect of that. This is uh, looking at, at major finance and, and banking groups. And if we have an economic relationship and I am damaged by some event that happens and you either depend on me for services or you depend on me purchasing your services, for example, my downfall has a knock-on effect to you. To you. Anticipating knock-on effects, however, and acting on them to say lay off workers, to reserve cash for businesses and industries also has a knock-on effect and it drives us vicious feedback. And if you think about what happened when we were turning off the energy in the ecosystem, that rapid rise in the curve is certain key species begin to encounter difficulties. They begin to respond by drawing more to the system and you get this vicious positive feedback that causes the system to unravel very rapidly. This anticipation of economic downturn, acting upon it, um, essentially accelerated the economic shocks. Okay, so, and so then we come back to Leontiev and, and Keynes and what we've done in a nutshell to give you a view of what we're doing is we're thinking of the economy in terms that these gentlemen did as essentially very complex systems of interconnected industries, business, and industrial sectors. And we're asking some very simple questions. We call our project the CASES project. Um, we're asking some basic questions. What is the effect of economic size? And this is coming from our thinking of ecosystems. How are economies of different sizes responding to the economic shock that COVID-19 has brought? What is the effect of economic diversity, having a very diverse economy having, versus having a very narrow economy, which might still be a very productive economy? And very importantly, what will or what should economic recovery look like? How much is it going to take out of us to recover the economy? But what I'm going to do, instead of getting into the model, we're going to wrap up with looking at results of the very first question that we've asked. We want to give ourselves a baseline in order to think about these other questions. And we're asking, okay, we know we're running a fine balance here between a health emergency and an economic emergency that it has precipitated as well as our own actions, our reaction to the health emergency. And we're asking, okay, 
if we're running the stance and some people fall on one side or the other of this, we're, we're killing the economy, we simply can't. Okay, let's ask ourselves this question. What if, what would be the economic impact if we had not put shelter in place or shut down action? So all we're asking is if we allow the disease to run its course, what would the economic impact be? Did we do this to ourselves? Like, did, did we actually do this to ourselves because of our shelter in place and shut down actions? And in order to do that, we're running a very nice and nicely complicated model that we've developed where we're translating the impact of the disease into right now only mortality in the workplace. So we're not dealing with layoffs and firings. We're not dealing with hospitalizations. We're looking only at mortality, the loss of labor production, the loss of workers because of mortality. We're focusing on the very large Los Angeles uh, system. And we're looking at things like industrial sectors, number of workers per sector, estimating COVID-19 mortality rates. And then from that, the mortality rates of, of uh, workers, of oh, sorry, of individuals that are of working age. And we're doing this for different values of R, asking what if the disease looked like this? What if we were dealing with an absolutely huge Wuhan style or Northern Italian style outbreak versus what we think we're dealing with in California? And then places in between where the outbreak has been or is being more severe, such as New York in the past few months or Arizona or Florida today. And so on the right, there is these different curves and these different curves, they're mortality curves, but they correspond to different R transmission values. Now note these numbers up here. So that 0 0.0006, that's telling us that 0.06%, for example, of our workforce today is being lost because of mortality. These are very, very small numbers. Okay. And when we do that, there's this figure mortality curves again on the left. When we do that, we can then look at the loss of labor production on the right. And a couple of things we'll note is that first, those lines are very flat. Okay. So you're losing workers, but the impact on the economy is barely measurable in terms of labor production. And it's not really trending downward to any significant extent. However, when it begins to trend downward, it happens very, very rapidly. There is a tipping point embedded in the way the industrial network of the economy works. It's a tipping point that probably un we could go centuries without coming anywhere near to this, but the pandemic is driving us into that neighborhood now. Also notice that the more severe the R, the more severe the outbreak, the sooner that collapse or that tip. And in a very severe outbreak, we would say, well, if we did nothing, then in about two months, we would have lost enough workers where the industrial network of Los Angeles would be in dire straits. Whereas if we're working in an R of about 1.5, we're looking at uh, the better part of 150 days that's a considerable amount of time in terms of dealing with a pandemic, even this one. Now, before I get to that cool figure, now what we did is we ask this question, but we look at an entire range of R values all the way from, from one, ranging up to 4.5, so that we can understand wherever you might be with, our, with your outbreak, you can then go into this solution and say, what does the future look like to me? And so I'll wrap up by explaining this really cool diagram. On this bottom axis here, we're looking at time in days since the initial mortality. On the next flat, flat axis, those are R naught values ranging from one to 4.5. And on that vertical axis is labor production. The flat part in the upper left is the region where nothing is happening to your economy. And if we look at that long extended part that stays up at the top of the surface of the swimming pool, if you will, those are our values that fall below 1.5. And what it tells us is that we could deal with this disease and this low level of transmission, hopefully low level of mortality well into the future with very little economic impact. 
If, however, we let it fall, run out of hand, and we don't deal with the epidemic, then we get this sort of cascade. The economy fails. You pick an R value, and at some point, ranging from severe values that are coming in a little over 50 days to probably somewhere we're dealing with in the United States, transmission values, R values in severe cases between 2 and 2.5. It's telling us that, look, if we did nothing within about six months, the economy would be in dire straits anyway because we'd all be too sick to work. Now, one very strong caveat here. These are very, 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 very preliminary results. We have high confidence in them, but there are lots of pieces of data that need to be cleaned up and data are hard to come by. Economic data take a tremendous effort to compile and I'm really beginning to appreciate the work that the economic workforce in the US, for example, does. The disease numbers are flying fast and furious as healthcare services, epidemiologists and so on, the CDC are, are, are struggling to cope with the changing situation. And we're in really sort of breaking, we, our group, are breaking new ground in trying to understand how these different systems are colliding, what we can learn from the various systems, and how we develop this synthesis of looking at them all together to ask questions like we're asking. And then I'm going to end here by just introducing you quickly to the rest of the group. Um, there's David Goodwin, who's a longtime collaborator of mine. We've never collaborated on anything like this, but it's something we've enjoyed over the years, spending a lot of time over beers talking about what if questions and human societies. Now we're doing it. Uh, Maricela Barca at the Academy, who's our data scientist, data wizard, and Joe Rusek, who is the guy that's, um, when I'm sitting here remotely trying to do this, Joe is the guy that's really adding the glue to a lot of this and very generous support from the National Science Foundation that has been generous enough to take a chance on, on funding these sorts of crazy questions that we're asking. And I'll stop there. Um, I'm kind of stunned by the profundity of all that. That is, um, it's really remarkable work. It also just makes me think about how difficult it is when you have this science that's not easy and it, you have to take some time to understand it and, um, and really kind of invest in understanding some underlying principles. And it's like, but the results are so important. So kind of that challenge of how do you, yeah, how do you talk about this? How do you help a society that's not used to diving in that deep and leaders who aren't used to diving in that deep make better decisions? Um, well, as I said, you're, you, you guys were the guinea pigs this morning. So you can <laughs> tell me how poorly or how well um, I, I did and, and, you know, and, and where, where we need to go with this. It's, that's a bit of a struggle. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, we have a lot of questions and they kind of span the entirety of your presentation. So they, they, they jump around a bit. It's also just amazing that like this kind of work is, it comes from the natural world. Like we learn the, the insights of, that fuel the model and then help us understand how systems work. Like that when people think about societies and economies and things like that, they don't think about how much there is to learn from just how the world works. It's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to start with this question from Lila because um, it's pretty salient. Uh, she says, this probably sounds naive, but is there a method by which scientists like you would share finding like, findings like these with policymakers? It seems so critical for them to know immediately. Yeah, that, that, is, that, is, such a, that is such a difficult one for many reasons. Um, this is something that scientists are dealing with a lot these days. When we talk about the biodiversity crisis, and the climate uh, crisis, and these days, you know, uh, the the pandemic that we're dealing with. How do we effectively communicate with other segments of society, and most importantly, policymakers, decision makers, who want information? They they want to be informed, but we really speak different different languages, and this is, I think, an area that scientists are are uh, becoming skilled in very quickly. We're, we're, we're working really hard to bring ourselves up to speed. One of the areas that, one of the tools that I use is speaking to speaking broadly 
about it. So not necessarily directly to policymakers, but policymakers listen. Um, the good ones listen to everybody. And there are others out there who can do as equally or better a job of taking what we as scientists say to the policymakers, or at least uh, making those connections where we can then get face to face and, and talk about things. But uh, packaging the science in a way that you don't get lost in the weeds um, you know, is, is important. Explaining models. Models are, I mean, like the mod, the results we show you are based on models that mathematically are very complicated, but they're designed to simplify what we're looking at. They're designed to simplify the, ec the economics, to simplify uh, the ecosystems, because as scientists, that's why we model. We want to look at important features. And that's something else to convey also. They're not simulations. They're not, um, they're not crystal balls, right? Mm -hmm. They, but they can be very informative and useful guide. So I would say in answer to the question, it's it's a work in progress. We're getting better at it. And I will also say that some of us, like myself, have the benefit of being at institutions like the academy where we we have communication machines. So <laughs> like, like Laurel here, when I, I talk about what I just talked about for an hour, there are people that I work with who are trained and skilled in thinking about how do I communicate this? How do we communicate this to the public? Or how do we communicate this to policymakers? Who are the policymakers who should care about this? And what do we need to do? What do we what do we need to ask Peter to say? Okay, um, that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> say 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 that again. And more and more institutions like ours are diversifying in that way. But I mean, I I think I personally have an advantage because of the way I work and who I work with. Mm -hmm. Um. This is related. Jason asked how you know, um, so you mentioned that these were early findings, just how you gauge when to start sharing things, especially if you think the outcome um, or the finding itself is, is important. Yeah. So the, the very first step and the absolutely most important one is peer review. And mm -hmm. that's having other people who, who spend a lot of time working on these issues, looking at this. So we need some ecologists because some of these models are coming from ecology. They're ecologically based models, but economists, epidemiologists, math, applied mathematicians should look at this because we never, never do anything that is correct the first time around. We miss things, we make mistakes, we make errors, um, or we say things in ways that could be stated much more effectively. And so you, you get the other eyes on it. And that's the very first step. We think this needs to happen quickly. So we've been working really hard. We've been spending a, a lot of time working on, on this project so we can get it together in a form very quickly where we can roll it out to other scientists and other interested and skilled persons um, like economists to say, what are we missing here? How do we make this um, ironclad and legitimate and at that point, then we would communicate it very broadly, not just to mm -hmm. policy makers, but um, we are all in this together, right? We're all being asked to do things to deal with the situation. I think we also, many, many of us obviously have, have ideas on the various problems that we're dealing with right now. So we wanna roll this out and then get the broader uh, societal brain looking at it and thinking about it. We want to do it quickly. Yeah. The, the peer review note is a really good one right now too, because I think so many people are hunting information desperately. Mm -hmm. and it's like if you're on Twitter and you're looking at things to yeah. cite, check if it's peer reviewed, because that's a really good way to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. And, and there've been some harsh lessons that scientists have learned over the last few months. And you said, whoa, this was just a preprint that we put out there for other scientists to look at. We're sorry you've taken it and you've run with it. On, on Twitter and yes and no, but we do have a responsibility. Like I used many varies there in saying this is preliminary to just say, we think that we have confidence in it. Obviously that's where, why we're talking about it. We've been working on it really hard, but you know, we think it's valuable, but please be aware that it, it's, it's still a work in progress. Right, right. Okay, thanks for that. Um, 
So this is a great question from Camilla or Camila. Uh, do you use databases such as iNaturalist for your work or do you only use data from other scientists? Oh, well, we, we use uh, databases. So I um, personally do not use iNaturalist, iNaturalist a lot for two reasons. One, the mo it, it deals with the modern and the modern that I work with is primarily marine. And we're just really beginning to build out the coastal bits of the marine environment in iNaturalist. I do contribute quite a bit to iNaturalist, so and I do a lot of education using iNaturalist because I love iNaturalist. Um, and then, of course, all the old stuff, the fossils, sadly, well, <laughs> not in I iNaturalist, but we do use databases. We make and build databases from our own collections. We make and build databases from collections and the scientific literature uh, globally, and of course, for this particular project, we're using many, many databases ranging from things being put together by uh, cities to state governments like the state of California, the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, and my goodness, people, you, you have to realize just the huge amount of work that the U.S. government does in providing. So if you ever want to know, you know, where, where do our taxes go? Wow, just start digging into economic data. And um, it's astounding how much information the US government uh, produces on sometimes an almost weekly basis. It's a lot of work, a lot of people working really hard and those databases are available to us. Yeah. So we use databases, yeah, we love them. <laughs> um. Suzanne asks, does your work have implications for people who say we should give up on protecting all species in favor of just saving the ones that can survive rising temperatures? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. The first thing I would say is, look, it, it's, it, it's taken us a few years to working with the ancient ecosystems, with the modern, modern coral reef systems, to be able to pinpoint what some of the critical areas of functionality might be in those systems, right? And even though we're able to do that, they're complex systems and we don't understand, we really, really do not understand the effects of making differential decisions like that, what the costs would be of losing particular species. Um, these are dangerous systems to work with. They're difficult to forecast mm -hmm. and it, there's one lesson that I would say is based on absolutely solid ground. It's, it's exactly that. These, these systems are difficult to forecast and we should treat them with an extreme amount of caution. So mm -hmm. I would say ultimately, yes. If we understood everything, we probably could go in and we have harsh decisions to make. We could make those decisions by picking and choosing. But if we make decisions based on information like, well, let's save the heat tol tolerant corals and we're going to be fine. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that because I look at the complexity of these systems and I will tell you, just like climate, just like human societies, um, they're difficult to forecast and it's dangerous to make, to approach them in any simple way. Right, okay. Um, let's see, Eric asks, is there a way to see evidence of a pandemic in the geological record? Um, no, we've certainly, those ideas have come about, like why did the dinosaurs all die out? Well, maybe they got swept by a disease, but no, we don't have evidence of pandemics in the fossil record. And really we, we wonder, you know, there've been questions about if pandemics do have a non-human record, if pandemics are human, phenomenon mm -hmm. and I lean on the side we do have we we have recorded in the historical record not the fossil record we've observed and we've recorded regional epidemics in in the natural world so for example in the 1980s a bacterial disease swept through long-spined sea urchins in the Caribbean basin and we we almost lost our long-spined urchins they're a nuisance to divers Lord knows my one physical encounter with one was not was not pleasant. Um, and but they're also very important to the ecosystem. They're major herbivores. When we almost lost them, then we lost part of that balance between corals and, and algae. Um, but it wasn't a pandemic. 
because these species are limited in their distribution. It's possible that pandemics might be restricted to the human world because we are globally spread and we have dense populations. And our first evidence of truly widespread epidemics only go back to late antiquity. So uh, the Roman Empire, the Ming Dynasty in China sharing the initial outbreak of the plague, for example, that stretched across Asia and Europe. And that might have been because of the dense trade networks, because of cities with large populations, a million people living in Rome. And sound familiar? Well, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, right. OK. Um, this one's from Kea. I hope I'm saying that right. And also, we're getting some great questions from a Columbia Summer Intensive class that's watching. Mm -hmm. Uh, she asks, what is your opinion on keystone species? Do you think that the loss of some species disrupts systems more than others, and why? Yes, absolutely. So keystone species, and a keystone species, sort of the, the, the strict definition in ecology, it's a species that maintains diversity because it preys on other species. And so you have all these different prey species, and one of them or a handful of them are competitively superior. And if left alone, they would take over the community and you would lose the competitively inferior species. By having that keystone predator, they keep everybody sort of in a balance and more of these prey species can coexist. So if you have a more diverse community. We think more broadly these days about keystone species as being any species where because of its interaction or perhaps some other function in the community like corals perhaps building that physical structure that's so important to diversity in a coral reef, we think more broadly of keystone species being those species where because of what they do, they maintain a higher level of diversity in the community. And absolutely there, there are keystone species and a lot of the work of, of ecologists centers around identifying who and what those keystone species are. Um, every species has its value, but um, I don't want to be sound harsh or unethical in saying that in terms of the diversity and the functioning of a community, some species truly are more important than others. Identifying those species though, then goes back to this idea of complexity, very, very careful who you designate as not being mm -hmm. the keystone species. We know the key, we know who some of them are, we definitely don't know who all of them are. Mm -hmm. So again, hedge, hedge our bets and be conservative. Right, okay. Um, so this question's from Sarah. And so you, you talked about how um, biodiversity kind of crept back over millions of years following earlier extinctions. She's curious whether it would come back even after a human-made extinction, which is an interesting, or would it, or would it come back differently, do you think? So yes, two questions. Would it come back? Um, yes. I. I doubt very much the power of humans to eliminate life on the planet, right? Um, I mean, the, the mass extinction I was talking about was absolutely devastating. The, the collision of the asteroid with the Earth 66 million years ago, that asteroid packed enough energy in its explosion that dwarfed the entire nuclear arsenal of the, of the world today times a factor of several thousand. It's a tremendous event. Life came back. Here, here we are, you know, for whatever reason, mammals and birds and clams all, all survived. So I, I think life has that re resilience. Um, you also, life will survive in pockets and refuges. We live on a very heterogeneous planet and the impact of anything that's damaging plays out differently. Um, the question for me or the worry for me is how much damage can we do? And I think we can do a tremendous amount of damage. And we are we are doing, and we have done quite a bit of damage already, but I think there's, uh, there's far more that we can do. And the more damage that we do, the more relevant the question of how will it come back uh, becomes, because what comes back depends on what's left and how well they do and how well, th as we've shown, how well they do with each with each other. And the recovery is not going to be something that's simple or quick. It's going to be fits and starts. This is something we think we see as a recurring theme 
in in the fossil record. And so it's going to be fits and starts and all hands are off mm -hmm. what it's going to look like. There's very mm -hmm. little predictability there, but mm -hmm. it'll, it'll come back, small comfort for us. Yeah, uh, there's a, several people observing that it's probably pretty easy for us to wipe ourselves out or at least make life pretty miserable for us rather, as opposed yeah. to just all life for biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah definitely. Um, so this one's from Chloe, this is great. Can we apply lessons learned from ecosystem recovery from events such as human activities and extinctions to economic recovery from COVID? Yeah, that's one of the things we're working on right now also is how do we, how do we think about recovery? And recovery is going to be several things, one of which will be a cessation of the disease, either because we've figured it out or we've brought it under control. Maybe it's something that's endemic in our population, but not something that's chronically damaging. Now, the other aspect of the recovery is what are we going to do about it? Um, we don't have the luxury of sitting back and waiting for evolution to drive recovery for us. We, an equivalent process would be sitting back and getting back into the marketplace and people go back and we restart the economy from scratch. We're, we're large populations, we have strong interdependencies. Um, people are really hurting in this crisis. And so we need to drive the recovery. We need to invest what we have in resources into driving recovery and driving it quickly. One of the questions we're very interested in is what should that recovery strategy be? So for example, should it be spread across the economy or are there little keystone sectors, if you will, that we should focus on? Should it be a, a one-time a punch to the economy? Should it be spread out over time? Should it be done unevenly over time? And these are questions that we can ask when we think about these things as sort of dynamic systems. We can do those sorts of experiments and say, well, you know, we might never, not necessarily get to an answer where we know that one is absolutely better than another, one strategy is better than another, but it would give us a range of strategies that we could then think about um, which ones can we actually implement? Example. So yeah, we're thinking about that a lot. Great, great. And as a as a just sort of a general wrap up question, we had lots of people ask how best to keep up with your work. So we can obviously drop your Twitter in there. Is there anything else you'd like us to to include for people? Um, yeah, there's my my Twitter feed. Um, there's there's a blog, also uh, that I write. Um, it used to be an occasional blog when we went into shutdown. Um, my heart really went out to a lot of my uh, younger junior paleontological colleagues, including graduate students that suddenly found themselves, we found ourselves frozen out of our programs. We've begun this sort of pro process of recovery, but I started writing about my work sort of from the ground up thinking about uh, community ecology and community ecology in, in paleontology. And I'm trying to write it to be very accessible to anybody with an interest in ecology, with a moderate, very, very moderate uh, mathematical background, for example. Um, and that is, it's on WordPress. It's just p um, prutnarine.wordpress.com. Okay. All yeah. right. We'll drop links to that and your um, Twitter and maybe your Academy page also, which has a lot of yeah. other resources and people. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of stuff. Okay. Out there. Okay, great. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming and, and spending time with us today. Um, we didn't get to all of the questions, so I may shoot you some to see if you can. That's fine. Yep. At your exactly. at your leisure. Um, and Breakfast Club viewers, uh, please come back Monday. We're going to be talking to UC Berkeley researcher Christine Wilkinson, who studies hyenas in Kenya, uh, um, conflict and conservation issues around them specifically. Tonight at 7 p.m., come back right here uh, for Nightlife. We'll take you to space. Um, but yeah, Peter, we're so so interested to follow your work, and we'd love to have you back on as soon as you um, as soon as that makes sense for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you again, and thank, hey, you. thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.